If you would, please find your Bible and open up to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6 is where we are today. We're continuing our sermon series on living counterculture Christianity. Also inside of your bulletin, there are some sermon notes. You can follow along with the sermon and the scriptures by reading those as well. We've been looking at Matthew chapter six, 5, 6, and 7, this sermon series based on the Sermon on the Mount, and so we're about halfway through with Matthew chapter 6 today, and we'll continue in the future. Next Sunday, we'll take a break from uh, the Sermon on the Mount as Pastor Chuck will be here. I don't know what he will be preaching on, but I'm sure it will be good, and I you, know you'll look forward to it. Also, we're memorizing some scriptures from each of these chapters. And so today we're looking at Matthew chapter 6, verses 20 and 21 as our scripture memory verse. I hope you've been working on it. If today's your first day to be here, don't worry about it. You can read it off the screen, but let's read it together. Will you say it with me? But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 20 and 21. Awesome. Today we will actually be looking a little closer at that particular, those two verses in our sermon. But I remind you that if we're going to live a counterculture Christianity, if we're going to live different from the ways of the world, then we have to treasure what God treasures. We have to treasure his word, his commands, his instructions, his ways, his strategies. And if we do that, we know that our heart will be in that same place. Our heart will be where our treasure is. Today we come to part 11 in this series, how to serve God with money. Did you know you can do that? Well, if you didn't, you're gonna find that out today. But here's the main biblical truth I want to get across to you today. Either we serve God with money or we will serve money as our God. And you cannot do both at the same time. We can make a choice, but Jesus points it out. You cannot serve both God and money at the same time. Let me ask a couple of questions here. What do you treasure the most in life? Another way of asking that, what do you possess that you consider to be the greatest value? Another way of asking it, what are the possessions that you've added to your insurance policy? And if you would allow me to take a look at your checkbook, I could tell you real quick like what you treasure the most in life. And if you looked at mine, you would be able to do the same. Jesus teaches us here in Matthew chapter six that there are two different treasures. They are treasures on earth, treasures in heaven. Our daily struggle is, which one are we going to choose to value and to treasure in life? Every day that we wake up, we have a choice. Am I gonna treasure the things of this earth or am I gonna treasure the things of heaven and of God? And the choice that we make affects us and it affects others. If I choose to treasure the things of earth, then I'm gonna suffer the consequences of that. If I choose to treasure the things of heaven, I will, I will reap the benefits of that. I almost said suffer. Reap the benefits of that and others around me will do the same. Well, today we're going to look at three specific ways to serve God with money. And I hesitate saying our money because whose money is it? It belongs to him anyway. So serve God with money. And each one of these three specific ways are pretty much saying the same thing just in a different, using different words. And the reason I've done that, because you will see in this passage, Jesus says the same thing over three different times and in three different ways. So we're looking at it with different words, but it all points to the same focus. We want to serve God with money. So look with me at number one. Here's the first idea. In order to serve God with money, we must practice earthly behaviors that will produce eternal benefits. Now remember, that whatever we choose to value in life, whatever we choose to treasure in life, it's going to affect us and it's going to affect others around us. Plus, as I'm pointing out in this first step, is that our attitudes and our behaviors here on earth, they can produce 
heavenly treasure. They, things that we do here on earth can have eternal benefits. And I want you to get that as we read this passage. Look at verses 19 through 21, chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Follow along as I read it. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. And he tells us why. Because there's consequences, right? Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And then here's our memory verse. But store up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And he gives us another reason why we should do that. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want to first talk about what Jesus is not restricting or what Jesus is not forbidding in this teaching. Number one, Jesus is not forbidding us to own property or to have possessions. Secondly, Jesus is not forbidding us to save for a rainy day. We learned to do that, or I did, in elementary school. We had savings accounts in elementary school. I don't know if you remember that time or not. Jesus is not forbidding us to enjoy the things of this earth. It is not material things that he is forbidding. It is our greedy attitude about material things that he is forbidding here. Jesus was not denouncing our material need. He was denouncing our material greed. You got that? Yeah. And his biggest concern is the condition of our heart. What's your heart thinking? What's your heart doing? So he gives us two different treasures here, earthly and heavenly. Our tendency, our human tendency is to be more concerned with earthly treasures. Why? Because we can feed it. We can touch it. We can smell it. We can taste it. You know, all our senses are geared towards the earthly treasures. But he wants us to understand that there are more valuable treasures in life that we need to invest in. Those are the heavenly treasures. And he even commands us which one to choose. If you've got a choice, he says, choose the heavenly treasure. Why? Because their treasures are safe compared to earthly treasures where they are not safe. And then he goes on to give us three examples of how earthly treasures are unsafe. The first one has to do with clothing. He says, where the moth can destroy. In that day and time for Jewish people, the most valuable clothing would have been made of wool, sheep's clothing, wool. However, the favorite food of the moth was wool. So even the most wealthiest Jewish people would have had a hard time protecting their clothing from the moth. Then he gives us an example of food. He talks about rusting. Things will rust away. This word in Greek, rust away, refers to eating away. So he's talking about rats and mice eating away food. And of course, in that day and time, people would have hoarded grain. And those hoarding the grain had trouble protecting the grain from the rats and the mice and the worms and other insects that would rust away at it. They would eat away at it. And finally, the third example here of how unsafe our earthly treasures are has to do with valuables. Now, in that day and time, they did not have a safe deposit box. Uh, they didn't have banks. So they would have taken their valuables and hid them in the ground somewhere in their house. And their houses would have been made of clay. So it had been very easy for a criminal to dig through the house, break in, find where the valuables are stored in the ground, and dig them up. So three different examples here of our clothing, our food, our valuables, of how unsafe they are here on earth. And even though we've come a long way in building a better mousetrap, even though we have safe deposit boxes now and banks, our earthly treasures on this earth are still unsafe, just as much as they were then. Everything that we presently see here on earth will eventually disappear. It will all be gone. Therefore, we are not, as Jesus says, to store up for ourselves treasures on earth. Instead, we're to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. We're to invest in things that last, have eternal benefit. And I emphasize again to you that things that you do here on the earth will make a difference with eternal benefits in eternal treasures. One day there was a wealthy man, he had just bought a brand new BMW sports car 
Anybody have a brand new BMW sports car? Okay, well, I'm safe in telling this story then. You may have a Volvo, but not a BMW, right? So he's in his sports car. He's got the window rolled down. Well, he would have done it with a button if it's a wealthy car. And he's put his left hand, his left arm out the door, you know, and he's driving down the road. All of a sudden, another car heading toward him lost control, and they sideswiped one another. So he pulls over, he gets out of his car, and he's looking at all the damage on the driver's side of the car where the other car sideswiped him. And he says, my brand new BMW. And he was starting to cry of all the damage to his new BMW. Finally, a policeman pulls up, and the policeman comes to him, and the policeman notices that his left arm is bleeding. When he had it out the window, the other car had sideswiped his arm as well as the car. So the policeman said, sir, are you okay? Your arm's bleeding. And the man looks down at his bleeding arm. He says, my Rolex. What happened to my Rolex? <laughs> You've probably heard that one before, right? It's sad when the things of this earth become more important to us than our own flesh and blood. Yet that is the culture we live in. It was the culture Jesus lived in. Not much has changed. We treasure things more than we treasure people sometimes. We value the looks of a house more than we value the peace within the home. We have become slaves to our master cards rather than servants to our master. And as Jesus teaches us here, our earthly treasures are not safe. I have on your outline there two truths to treasure. We're going to do this at each point. Look at these with me. Earthly treasures will eventually disappoint me. Why? Because they're not safe. If I put all my time and energy and money and effort into treasuring up earthly treasures, I'm going to be disappointed. The other side of the coin, the second truth, eternal treasures will never disappoint me. They are safe, and then my heart will be safe too. So what exactly are the earthly behaviors that I, you and I can practice that will produce these eternal benefits, that will produce eternal heavenly treasure? When Matthew wrote these words of Jesus, he, of course, was writing in Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek. And he uses a word here translated as treasure that you've heard before. It's a Greek word called thesaurus. And today, thesaurus means a treasury of words. Back then, it was just a treasury. And he uses it on, in two different ways here. He uses it as a noun and as a verb. So the, the translation literally reads, treasure up treasures. That's what it says in the Greek. Treasure up, the verb, treasures, the noun. So we can see what he's teaching us here. Think about it. It takes a lifetime for you and I to build up a thesaurus of words. We learn words when we're little. We learn more words when we grow up, and we just keep learning more and more words. It takes a lifetime to build a treasury of words. Likewise, it takes a lifetime of doing godly behaviors to build up treasures in heaven. It doesn't happen overnight, does it? So, for example, what are some of these behaviors? Some of the things that we've already learned in the Sermon on the Mount, being salt and light in our world. Loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. These are earthly behaviors that have eternal benefits. Behaviors like forgiveness and love and grace, mercy, kindness, and compassion. The idea of seeking God's will and then obeying God's will. We talked about that in the um, Lord's Prayer as we looked at it. Serving the local church, giving money to help others. All of these are earthly behaviors that have eternal benefits and store up treasures in heaven. They are safe. They are secure. They are heavenly treasures. And remember, whatever you choose to treasure, it is going to affect you and it's going to affect others as well. So why not do what Jesus is saying here. Lay up those treasures in heaven where they're safe. Your heart's going to be safe and you'll be blessing other people as well. Place value on what is heavenly. Place value on what is safe and secure and what will last. And your heart 
will be safe as well. Now look at a second way that we can serve God with no money. Number two, in order to serve God with money, we must practice earthly generosity that will produce eternal glory. Now that's very similar to what I just said, but Jesus says it in a little bit different way here. First of all, he gave us two treasures, earthly and heavenly. Now he's gonna give us two perspectives, bad and good. And I'll explain it here. Look at the passage with me, verses 22 and 23. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So the illustration here is about our eyes being a lamp of the body. And just like these windows, when the window is clean, it lets in a lot of light. We understand that. If the window is foggy or if it's dirty, it lets in less light. So we understand the illustration. If our eye is good, it allows a lot of light to come into our body. If our eyes are bad, not as much light. It is full of darkness instead. So the illustration is clear. We understand what Jesus is saying, but the question is, what in the world, Jesus, does that have to do with money? What does that illustration have to do with treasures, be they heavenly and earthly? Well, to understand it better, we have to look at what these words mean from the Greek context. Again, Matthew's writing in Greek. And in the Greek language, the word good here has several different meanings. It can mean clear, as we've talked about already. It can mean single, as in a single-minded focus. But this word good also refers to generosity. That makes all the difference. And then the word bad can mean evil, but it also can refer to acting with greed. So in the context of Jesus talking about money and heavenly and earthly treasures, the proper understanding here of this illustration should be good refers to generosity and bad eyesight would refer to greediness. Therefore, if our eye is good, if our perspective is one of generosity, then that's a sign we're storing up treasures where? In heaven. However, if our eye is bad, if our perspective on material things is one of greediness, then that's a clue that we are that we treasure up things here on earth. So the good equals generosity, the bad equals greed. And if our eyes are good, then we're full of light. If our eyes are bad, we're full of darkness. When I was in the sixth grade, I became interested in playing the drums. But I didn't have any drums. <laughs> So I had an older cousin. He was six years older than me. He was headed off to college uh, to play football for the University of Alabama. His name was Roger Chapman. And so Roger gave me his drum set. It was an old beat-up four-piece drum set, but as far as a sixth grader was concerned, man, this was Christmas time, you know. So I got this drum set. My mom and dad put it way out in the storage shed where I could practice. And I love that thing. I learned how to play drums on this old beat-up four-piece drum set. But then I got smart. Every Christmas and every birthday, I would ask for more drums and more cymbals. And by the time I got to my 12th grade, the high school senior year, I now had an 11-piece drum set, all brand new, and I gave my cousin Roger back that junk he gave me. <laughs> Also in high school, because of having now a nicer drum set, I got to play in a country band with my friends, and that was a lot of fun, except we had to play in a lot of bars. We're, we were too young to be there, but we were the music for the night, you know. I took my drum set off to college and soon found the opportunity to play in church and to play in three different Christian bands during my four years of college. It was also that time I got asked to play in a church where I met this beautiful young girl named Mim, and now she's my wife. So playing the drums led me to my wife. How about that? After college, I went off to seminary, 
and immediately got asked to play drums in a church there in Fort Worth, Texas. A sixth grade boy came up to me after service one day and said, I want you to teach me how to play the drums. So I said, okay, and his parents were going to pay me a little bit of money. It wasn't a lot way back then. So I started teaching him how to play the drums. And after several months of doing that, I realized he wasn't getting any better. Had nothing to do with my teaching. He did not have a drum set to practice on. So you see where this story is going, don't you? After about a year of doing that, I got engaged to Mim, and I also got a job at a different church being a youth pastor. And it suddenly dawned on me that here I have this great value and treasure of a drum set, but I really don't need it anymore. And I knew that once I got married, she was not going to allow that thing in the house. <laughs> Wives just don't do that, right? So here I had this great value, something that I had treasured for 10 years, something that I had put together piece by piece. I had polished and buffed those cymbals time after time. I'd put that drum set together. I'd taken it apart. It had seen me through the bad times of playing in bars on Saturday nights to the good times of playing on churches on Sunday mornings. It was more valuable than the car I drove at that time. You've driven a car like that before, haven't you? And yet I thought, here's this boy that wants to play and doesn't have one. So what do you think I did? I gave it to him. And I moved away, started working in a different church. I've never seen him again. I never know what happened to that drum set. But I'm hoping and praying that he would have passed it on later in life as well and done the same thing. What do you possess of great value today? I ask that question again. More importantly, what could you live without? Is there someone else who needs it more than you? Or perhaps could you sell something of great value and use that money to bless someone who needs it today? Here's the tough question. Do I treasure my possessions or do I tre treasure generosity? Are my eyes good or bad? Am I generous or greedy? If my eyes are good, Jesus says, if my perspective is generous, then how much more light will be in me? That's the illustration, isn't it? Two more truths to treasure. Look on your notes there from this part of the scripture. Earthly greed will what? Darken my life. If my eyes are bad, my life's full of darkness. Jesus makes that clear. So earthly greed will darken my life. What's the other side of the coin? Earthly generosity will enlighten my life. So I challenge you to practice earthly generosity. Why? Because it reaps the eternal benefits. And the glory of God will be shining brightly inside of you here on earth. Now, one more idea. Number three. Look at number three with me. In order to serve God with money, we must practice earthly service to an eternal Savior. So Jesus gave us two treasures, heavenly and earthly. He gave us two perspectives, generosity or greed. Now he gives us two gods. He makes it very clear what he's saying here. Either you serve God with your money, or you're going to serve money as your God. Look at the way Jesus says it. Verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Why? Either he will hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Makes it very clear, doesn't it? Yet, you and I constantly try to disprove that truth over and over, year after year. We want to disprove it. Now, in that day and time, people were more familiar with slavery than you and I are, and they understood that if you were a slave, you could only have one owner. It is impossible for a slave to have two different masters, two different owners. But you and I look at this and we say, but wait a minute. I can multitask. I can work two jobs at the same time. Some of you have done that. I can have two bosses. 
What does that really matter? But yet what Jesus was talking about was complete ownership of a person, being a slave to something, where you are single, singly devoted to someone as your master. And it was impossible to have a second one. But in our world of multitasking, somehow we have convinced ourselves that Jesus was wrong and that we can serve God on Sunday and do whatever we want the rest of the week. We can serve any other God. We believe that we can worship the Creator on Sunday and worship His creation the other six days of the week. But our belief doesn't match what Jesus says in verse 24, does it? You cannot, he says, serve the Creator, serve God, and His creation at the same time. You can't do that. So if we're going to serve God, in God alone, we must stop being controlled by the God of money or the God of material things. Now, how do I know? How do I know if I'm serving God or if I'm being controlled by money, if I'm serving money? We have to ask ourselves some questions. When money becomes my one measuring rod of success, then money is my God. When money becomes my one desire in life, then money has become my God. When money becomes my only main weapon for dealing with life's problems, then money has become my God. So ask yourself, who controls you? Is it God or money? Who are you serving? Is it God or money? Going back several years, 1997, I got asked to come and pastor a church in New Jersey. And you know the difference between the South and New Jersey is like night and day, isn't it? So that was a huge uh, culture shift for me and my family. But in the process of moving to New Jersey, I went ahead of time to secure a place to live, to buy a house. My wife stayed in South Carolina to sell our present house. So we were split up for a while. In the process of buying a brand new house, you know that you have to get a mortgage, you have to have a credit report done, the bank has to look at all your assets and all your income. So my credit report came back and it said that I owed $20,000 in credit card debt with five different credit cards. And I looked in my wallet and I saw one credit card and I said, what in the world's going on? So I had to do some investigating. And I found out the hard way that a relative of mine had taken out five credit cards in my name and my social security number and maxed them all out for $20,000. I knew nothing about it. This was before internet, okay? Someone had stolen my identity. We talk about stolen identity. It happened to me even before the internet. So I had to confront that relative and they finally admitted they had done wrong and even though they admitted the wrong, it still took me a lot of time to clear my name so that we could buy a house and move in there. I mean, we finally did. But I tell you that story to illustrate the pain that happens when we choose to serve money as our God. When we choose to serve the treasure, or we, when we choose to serve and treasure the God of money, not only do we hurt self, we hurt who? We hurt our loved ones. We hurt people around us. And you cannot deny that. It happens all the time. Your choice to worship money will not only cause more pain in your life, it will cause pain to those who love you and care deeply about you. But you see, there's another side of the coin. The other side of the coin is when we choose to worship God and God alone, then we're able to use money to bless others and not hurt them. Do you see the difference? Do you see the importance of this teaching of Jesus? So two more truths to treasure. Look under number three there on your notes. Number one, being controlled by money, what does it do? It hurts me and it hurts others. What's the other side of the coin? Serving God with money blesses me and blesses others. Which one would you rather have? Jesus says you cannot serve both at the same time. So I challenge you today to practice earthly service to an eternal Savior. 
Serve Jesus Christ. Serve God and God alone. Stop being controlled by money or other gods and instead use the money God has given you to serve him. My invitation to you is simply that today. It's the title of the sermon there. Serve God with money because you can't do them both at the same time. Let me remind you though that the possession of money is not a sin. Instead, the possession of money is a serious responsibility for providing for self, providing for family, providing for others. And I remind you that God has created everything on this earth and God owns everything. So when we choose to serve and worship created things rather than God, the creator, we're hurting ourselves and we're missing out on the best. So I encourage you today that while you are here on the earth, serve God with the money he's given you. Let's pray about that decision. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this teaching of Jesus, how clear, how simple it is. Thank you for teaching us what we are to treasure in life. Thank you for showing us the consequences of not doing, of not treasuring you. And thank you for warning us against serving the God of money. So today we confess our sin to you, God, that we have been greedy. We have ignored generosity. We have ignored earthly behaviors that would produce heavenly treasure. So forgive us. And today, Lord, we choose something different. We choose to serve you with the money you've provided. You are God, we choose to serve you, we choose to treasure you, we choose to love you. And we do this in Jesus' name, amen.